Hey everybody, this is Stuart with Wine on the Diamond. Today I'm going to do a 2022 kind of recap video. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to, to go back and take a look at some of the things on the channel, like the best and the worst wines, and then a few other things that are kind of thrown at the end, like some interesting channel demographics and something I thought was a personal favorite of mine that I did throughout the year. So with that being said, let's go ahead and just take a look at the high level of what happened on the channel in 2022. Uh, so I did 123 videos. I was shooting for 156 videos. So I was roughly 80% of the way there. Uh, I use the OKR method and uh, to me that is about 80% attainment, which means I did a pretty good job trying to reach a pretty difficult goal because that means I would have had to release three videos a week every week without fail. That was hard. Sometimes it was two, sometimes it was one, sometimes it was four depending on whatever I was able to fit in but overall uh, I feel like I did pretty good providing you content this year on the channel and um, I'm gonna continue to try to strive for 156 next year. We're gonna we're gonna see how it goes. With that being said, and I am using some notes here, so I apologize because I have a lot to go through today. Uh, I had 55 reds reviewed, 35 whites, 25 rosés, six sparklings, seven others like sake, uh, and then three product reviews that I did. I'm actually working on another product review that's gonna be coming out either this week or next week. Uh, depending on when this video gets actually released. Uh, Corvin was nice enough to send me something. So thank you, Corvin. I've been working on this review for a month now and I'm almost done wrapping it up. So that being said, that's the very high level of like how many videos and, and their breakdowns. Um, I, I do have a little bit more information at the very end after I've talked about the best and the worst wines that talks more about like subscribers, uh, le least liked video, most liked video, stuff like that. So if you're interested in just kind of some of the, the sausage of the channel or the winemaking? The crush? I don't know how that would translate into this, but if you're interested in the behind scenes stuff, uh, I, I, I'm going to post some of that information in here at the end, after all the wines. So if you're interested and you don't care about the wines, you want to know about the channel, just go into the video description and click the, the time tag and you'll get there. So anyway, with all that being said, uh, the best wine that, or the best red wine, I should say, I reviewed this year was the 2015 Catlia Wines Sobranus Vineyard Syrah. So the thing I really liked about this wine is just how incredible it was overall. The balance was great, the length was really good, the intensity was really good, the complexity, it has so much potential. <laughs> and, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, I was already starting to taste a little bit of the tertiary because it is a seven year old wine, but I am, I, I, it can keep going. Like, like that length might actually improve, that intensity might improve if you factor in the tertiary quality of it. The complexity might improve as well because it will gain more tertiary over time if you let it continue to age a little bit. So overall, I thought that red wine was totally awesome. Now coming in a close second to that wine was the 2018 Conti di Briganzo Amarone di Val Pugliacella. Um, that was one I got at $18 at Trader Joe's and it tasted like it was a $40 plus dollar per bottle wine. Like it, it just... The, what you got out of that wine for $18 was very impressive. I was very happy with it. And it is a wine that I have bought again since then, um, especially whenever I was gonna have a at-home steak night when my wife was traveling. When my wife travels, I like to make myself a steak because I have to deal with the kids and all, what is it, nine of our animals now? So uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have a lot of things on my plate and I like to reward myself with a steak. And that was the wine that I chose during one of our last trips. So my best rosé of 2022 was the 2021 Adega Vinho Tempranillo Grenache Rosé. I, I, I was wondering why they were so excited for me to show up the day I was there. I was just going there to get some wine, just to bring back um, as a part of one of my trips from the Hill Country. I was actually right around the time I was getting all the wines for the, the Texas Hill Country month that I did for uh, Texas Wine Month in October. And uh, Michael was just like, I really want you to make sure you, you take this one home with you. So I was like, okay, there's a reason behind that. That wine was really, really darn good. So if you're out in the hill country, definitely stop by Adega Vinho. If hopefully they have some of it left. If not, then you missed out on a spectacular wine. That just means you're just gonna have to come back and wait for their next release and then pick some of it up then. In terms of my best white wine of the year, uh, I'm gonna say that goes to the 2018 Lazar Wines uh, Moschina Mosh Pit White Wine Blend. That wine just had a really great mix of balance, length, intensity. Uh, um, it, 
at really everything. I mean, it was just a really great mix of everything for a white wine. Uh, it, it's, it was kind enough on your palate to be a solo drinker. It was complex enough and had enough acid and body to carry itself and paired it with food. Overall, I was just really happy with that wine. Now, in a close second place was the 2021 French Connection Winery Pickpool Blanc. That was one of those where it was so different than some of the other pick pulls that I've had. It had more body, it had more intensity, it had more alcohol, but it still preserved that pick pull acid, that lip stinging acid that you expected it to have. I was just really happy about it. In the end, it just got slightly beat out, and I mean by like less than a tenth of a point on my chart that I use by the Lazar wine. So both of those wines, if you can get your hands on them, then that's fantastic. If, if you can't, then like I said, you're just gonna have to keep trying them and maybe you can pick up another vintage if they're sold out. But if you can, if you have those wines, then you're gonna be in good shape. In terms of my favorite sparkling wines of the year, um, I have I have two that are they're pretty much tied for each other. So the first one is the Straw by Ardante Organic Prosecco. This was a fantastic mix of having a really good balance and length and intensity on a Prosecco. The thing that was lacking for me on this wine a little bit was I would like to have had more of a breadth of complexity. And that's kind of where that other wine picks up. So the wine that actually ended up tying uh, for my favorite sparkling was the Borasca Prosecco uh, Superior DOCG. Um, so this also had a good mix of those balance, length, and intensity. However though, it, was, it didn't have as long but it had more of a wider range in its complexity on the palate with its primary fruit. So that's why I had a hard time distinguishing which of those I preferred better, just because it depends on kind of what you're looking for. And in the end, they pretty much rated the same, so I gave them just both a tie on this one. So to, to kind of wrap up my favorites of the year, uh, my favorite other was the Tozai Living Jewel Junmai Sake. Uh, that was just a very pleasant, drinking experience and I, I just got a lot out of it and it was $12 so the fact that I can get a really good sake that is not only good at room temp I, I warmed it I tried it cold they work all of them work with that wine so it's just one of those things where it was such a great value offered so much that I felt like it had to be highlighted as one of my favorites for for this year and now I guess this also falls in the favorite category, but it's not necessarily a wine. My favorite intro for my videos to shoot this year was the one I shot for the 2017 Colt Cabernet. Um, that was one where, as I was shooting it, my neighbor, my, 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 my family was gone. So my, my, my dog was locked up uh, in her kennel so that way she wouldn't like run in and out of the house. Uh, my neighbors were in the process of moving things in and out of their house with contractors. Uh, as part of a remodel and I was at home by myself. So I decided, hey, I'm gonna shoot a funny video intro and I'm gonna have fun. My neighbors probably think I am some sort of crazy person because all they saw was my front door open and me moving around to lots of different locations with the camera doing weird stuff. And like I could see them looking through into my house from across the street and the gears were turning in their head like, did we make the right decision to live on this block? So it, I, I thought it was a fun intro and I'll include the link to it in the video description if you haven't seen it. So now I'm gonna move on to the worst category. And I say worst because really there's, in terms of true proper wines, there's only one that rated bad. Every, all the rest of them were okay. So my least favorite of the year was the 2021 Nicalia Bella Syrah Malbec Red Wine Blend. That was just a mouthful of disappointment. I mean, there's no balance to the wine. There was no length. It had a pretty much immediate clean finish. Uh, I think I gave it like a quarter to a third of a point on intensity. Like there had some intensity on the nose and the palate um, because I could actually smell things. But uh, then when you get into the complexity, the complexity was all gone. Like there's, it was such a, it was one of the few wines this year that I actually paired with the drain. So moving on to the worst rosé, uh, the worst rosé I had, and like I said, this is where now I'm just saying, this is the least okay rosé that I had, uh, was the 2019 Prophecy Rosé. Um, the thing about this one is it had no points in length and intensity or complexity, but it was a balanced wine. And I know that sounds weird, but you can still have structural balance without necessarily having a long finish or 
a lot of complexity. So when, when, you, when you put the wine in your mouth, the structure of it still tastes like it should, but none of the other components really were there. So that's why I gave it my least favorite rosé. My worst white of the year was the 2019 Crimson Ranch Chardonnay. And the reason why I gave this wine my least favorite white was because the alcohol of the wine was not integrated whatsoever. It, it almost tasted like an entirely separate component that was bottled on top of a juice. Like it, it didn't really feel like anything was there. On the nose it burned, on the palate, everything was just really weird. So uh, because of that and the lack of that integration, I, it was my least favorite white. If that had been integrated, then the answer would be different here. I'd probably have gone for a different white wine. But uh, in terms of this, like I said, it rated okay, but it's just that integration was one of the things that just didn't work out for me. And or I should say lack of integration. It didn't work out for me. And that's, that's why it made the list this year. In terms of my least favorite sparkling wine, I'm going to give that to the Blanc de Blue uh, Cuvée. <laughs> so the thing about this is that it, it's an interesting concept, but it just, it didn't execute on its full potential in my opinion. Like I had Proseccos that were more complex than this wine. And I felt like this just needed to have some more complexity, a little bit more intensity. There was just some things missing there. Like I said, cool concept. And if you tried it, I mean, it's worth a try because it's just an interesting thing to try. But overall, I, I don't feel like it really lived up to what it could have been. And as a result, it's more of like, I'm disappointed in it, which is why he made the grade for the least favorite sparkling. All right, so now going into the uh, others, my least favorite other things that I reviewed. Uh, so the first one is going to be the Stella Rosa Blueberry. Uh, that was one my wife got me and um, it tasted 100% fake, 100% fake. I didn't mind the sweetness, but like I've had I've had candy that tastes more real in flavor than that. Uh, it, it just it, it, it's just not. It wasn't a good experience for my palate because I, when I when I taste things, I'm tasting them like is it a is it tart? Is it is it a, is it like a tart fresh fruit or is it more of like a dried fruit note or stewed or cooked? Like I'm 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 checking for those characters of those primary flavors. One of the things I never like when I'm t drinking wine, which is a natural product in my opinion, is fake tasting stuff. So uh, that's something that, that kind of bugs me and uh, that's why I didn't like it. And I forgot to say this is actually a tie category because the other thing that I liked, liked the least uh, in terms of just the other category was uh, the Boone's Farm Blue Hawaiian. If you like drinking coconut oil, this is for you. I don't like drinking coconut oil. I, I just, I just couldn't do it. So, so this, it didn't taste as fake <laughs> as the Stella Rosa, but it was just, it actually had like an unctuous texture on the mouth, which was weird and I didn't like that. I thought it would be something that was a little bit more of like a, like crisp mixer type of thing that you could use and no, 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 no. It was just, it just, it was oily coconut oil and I did not like that. All right, so now I'm gonna end with some interesting channel things that I discovered. So I was looking through, YouTube Studio has like an entire metric section and I can like slice up different bits of information like who liked what on video, at what point do you guys drop off watching my videos, uh, what is my average engagement rate, uh, and then there are other tools I can use to kind of compare myself to other people if I want. I don't necessarily do that because to be honest, I'm not doing this to be a professional YouTuber. It's a hobby for me and I really enjoy sharing it with you guys, which is one of the reasons why I do this. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where I just found some interesting things and wanted to share them with you. So let's get started on the most viewed video. All right, so the most viewed video that I released in 2022 was uh, the 2019 uh, Lavelle Ferrum uh, Red Wine Blend. So I released that and that got over 4,000 views since it got released. So that's a pretty nice chunk of change because YouTube is sort of this aggregate game when you're looking at engagement and people finding your content. And so the fact that 4,000 of you, which is like a large school here in Texas, I probably shouldn't compare wine to school. That's not good. That's like a reasonably sized large company for a lot of folks. Um, that That's pretty impressive. So I, I thank you guys for doing that. 
Uh, now, going into just the most watched video of the year, regardless of when I published it, uh, was the 20, let me make sure I get this right, 2016 Decoy Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, that received uh, about 7.8 thousand views in one year. And then following close to that was uh, the Post Malone Maison Number no. 9 Rosé Review, in which I received a little over 6,000 views. So uh, I didn't publish either of those this year. Like I said, I just just wanted to see what y'all were watching this year. And so uh, red wines and rosé. So I guess I guess that was nice. Uh, I did do something goofy with the Post Malone one, but Decoy's a pretty well-known brand. I'm pretty sure it's just people wanting to know if they should buy it or not. Uh, in terms of Laval Ferrum, it's a great, great value wine. It's typically like somewhere between eight to nine dollars at most grocery stores, at least it is where I live. And uh, it's one of those wines where I can buy that or the rosé, and I'm always going to have people who enjoy it. Like, I, I just don't have people who don't enjoy that $8 wine. I don't get it. But you know what? It's it's stuff I recommend out to people. And if you're interested in seeing why I like that red wine, go watch the video in the link below. My least watched video of the year was the 2020 Rutherford Hill Rosé. I only got 83 views on that video since it got released. I have no clue why y'all hated it. I can't find anything in the metrics that shows an abnormal drop-off rate or anything. My only guess is that maybe the social media algorithms didn't pick it up. Maybe I released it during like an important sports event, no one cared. I have no idea. I, I Phase of the moon, regardless. Um, it wasn't a well-watched video in terms of overall <laughs> views, so I just thought it was funny in the contrast that I released a video that has 4,000 views in one year, and I released another one that has 83. I don't get it. YouTube is weird. So in terms of video likes, my most liked video was the 2020 Trader Joe's Reserve Merlot Review, and my least liked video was the MD 2020 Orange Jubilee, what I call bum wine. Maybe I said a bum wine and people really took offense to it. I, I don't... I mean, that's the other category that I assume with those types of things, because uh, they're kind of marketed as wines in a way in certain places. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting because I had people ask me to review those types of things, like the bum wines and uh, other stuff of that nature, and it was the least liked video of the year. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, YouTube's a weird thing. Can't explain it. In terms of subscribers, I gained over 2,000 subscribers this last year, which is almost a 50% increase from where I was at the beginning of the year. So one, thank you guys so much for subscribing to the channel, continuing to come back and watch that content. However, I will say that on the average video, 80% of you who are watching are not subscribed. 80.5% specifically, so that means 19.5% of you are subscribed, so thank you, but for the 80.5, come on, there's a little red button, just click that. And as a matter of fact, there's a little notifications bell. And going into that specific stat, only 6.4% of you have all notifications for my channels enabled. And on top of that, only 3.3% of you have all notifications and the push notifications for my channel enabled. So come on, come on, I'm, it's the little, little bell. Just gotta click that bell. And that way you know every single time a wine review has been posted, so you know whether or not it's gonna be any good. And my final bit of demographics is two thirds of my viewers are male and two thirds of my viewers live in the United States. I don't know if two thirds of the people in the United States watch me are male or not. It doesn't break down like that. So with that being said, that's 2022 for Wine on the Dime in a nutshell. And I would like to thank everybody for continuing to watch the videos. I have more wine reviews scheduled for this year. I'm gonna to try to get back into doing more winery visits, uh, hopefully get more product reviews like that Gorovin one coming up soon. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, just subscribe, hit that notifications bell, try to bump those numbers up, y'all. Bump them up. You want to know when these videos are coming out. I see you guys keep coming back, and you don't want to waste money buying bad wine. So ultimately, I'm here to help, and I will see you all again soon with a wine review or a product review or something from Wine on the Dime. Happy 2023.